Section eight of All of Grace by Charles Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The Increase of Faith. How can we obtain an increase of faith? This is a very earnest question to many. They say they want to believe, but cannot. A great deal of nonsense is talked upon the subject. Let us be strictly practical in our dealing with it. Common sense is as much needed in religion as anywhere else. What am I to do in order to believe? One who was asked the best way to do a certain simple act replied that the best way to do it was to do it at once. We waste time in discussing methods when the action is simple. The shortest way to believe is to believe. If the Holy Spirit has made you candid, you will believe as soon as truth is set before you. You will believe it because it is true. The gospel command is clear. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It is idle to evade this by questions and quibbles. The order is plain. Let it be obeyed. But still, if you have difficulty, take it before God in prayer. Tell the Great Father exactly what it is that puzzles you, and beg him by his Holy Spirit to solve the question. If I cannot believe a statement in a book, I am glad to inquire of the author what he means by it, and if he is a true man his explanation will satisfy me. Much more will the divine explanation of the hard points of Scripture satisfy the heart of the true seeker. The Lord is willing to make himself known. Go to him, and see if it is not so. Repair at once to your closet, and cry, O Holy Spirit, lead me into the truth. What I know not, teach thou me. Furthermore, if faith seems difficult, it is possible that God the Holy Spirit will enable you to believe, if you hear very frequently and earnestly that which you are commanded to believe. We believe many things because we have heard them so often. Do you not find it so in common life? that if you hear a thing fifty times a day, at last you come to believe it? Some men have come to believe very unlikely statements by this process, and therefore I do not wonder that the good spirit often blesses the method of hearing the truth, and uses it to work faith concerning that which is to be believed. It is written, Faith cometh by hearing, therefore hear often. If I earnestly and attentively hear the gospel, one of these days I shall find myself believing that which I hear, through the blessed operation of the Spirit of God upon my mind. Only mind you to hear the gospel, and do not distract your mind with either hearing or reading that which is designed to stagger you. If that, however, should seem poor advice, I would add next, consider the testimony of others. The Samaritans believed because of what the woman told them concerning Jesus. Many of our beliefs arise out of the testimony of others. I believe that there is such a country as Japan. I never saw it, and yet I believe that there is such a place, because others have been there. I believe that I shall die. I have never died, but a great many others have done so whom I once knew, and therefore I have a conviction that I shall die also. The testimony of many convinces me of that fact. Listen, then to those who tell you how they were saved, how they were pardoned, how they were changed in character. If you will look into the matter, you will find that somebody just like yourself has been saved. If you have been a thief, you will find that a thief rejoiced to wash away his sin in the fountain of Christ's blood. If unhappily you have been unchaste, you will find that men and women who have fallen in that way have been cleansed and changed. If you are in despair, you have only to get among God's people, and inquire a little, and you will discover that some of the saints have been equally in despair at times, and they will be pleased to tell you how the Lord delivered them. As you listen to one after another of those who have tried the word of God, and proved it, the divine spirit will lead you to believe. Have you not heard of the African who was told by the missionary that water sometimes became so hard that a man could walk on it? He declared that he believed a great many things the missionary had told him, but he would never believe that. When he came to England it came to pass that one frosty day he saw the river frozen, 
but he would not venture on it. He knew that it was a deep river, and he felt certain that he would be drowned if he ventured upon it. He could not be induced to walk the frozen water till his friend and many others went upon it. Then he was persuaded, and trusted himself where others had safely ventured. So, while you see others believe in the Lamb of God, and notice their joy and peace, you will yourself be gently led to believe. The experience of others is one of God's ways of helping us to faith. You have either to believe in Jesus or die. There is no hope for you but in Him. A better plan is this. Note the authority upon which you are commanded to believe, and this will greatly help you to faith. The authority is not mine, or you might well reject it. But you are commanded to believe upon the authority of God Himself. He bids you to believe in Jesus Christ, and you must not refuse to obey your Maker. The foreman of a certain works had often heard the gospel, but he was troubled with the fear that he might not come to Christ. His good master one day sent a card around to the works. Come to my house immediately after work. The foreman appeared at his master's door, and the master came out and said somewhat roughly, What do you want, John, troubling me at this time? Work is done. What right have you here? Sir, he said, I had a card from you saying that I was to come after work. Do you mean to say that merely because you had a card from me, you are to come up to my house and call me out after business hours? Well, sir, replied the foreman, I do not understand you, but it seems to me that, as you sent for me, I had the right to come. Come in, John, said his master. I have another message that I want to read to you. And he sat down and read these words. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you think, after such a message from Christ, that you can be wrong in coming to him? The poor man saw it all at once, and believed in the Lord Jesus unto eternal life, because he perceived that he had good warrant and authority for believing. So have you, poor soul. You have good authority for coming to Christ, for the Lord himself bids you trust him. If that does not breed faith in you, think over what it is that you have to believe, that the Lord Jesus Christ suffered in the place and stead of sinners, and is able to save all who trust him. Why, this is the most blessed fact that ever men were told to believe, the most suitable, the most comforting, the most divine truth that was ever set before mortal minds. I advise you to think much upon it, and search out the grace and love which it contains. Study the four evangelists, study Paul's epistles, and then see if the message is not such a credible one that you are forced to believe it. If that does not do, then think upon the person of Jesus Christ. Think of who he is, and what he did, and where he is, and what he is. How can you doubt him? It is cruelty to distrust the ever-truthful Jesus. He has done nothing to deserve distrust. On the contrary, it should be easy to rely upon him. Why crucify him anew by unbelief? Is not this crowning him with thorns again, and spitting upon him again? What, is he not to be trusted? What worse insult did the soldiers pour upon him than this? They made him a martyr, but you make him a liar. This is worse by far. Do not ask, How can I believe? But answer another question, How can you disbelieve? If none of these things avail, then there is something wrong about you altogether, and my last word is, Submit yourself to God. Prejudice or pride is at the bottom of this unbelief. May the Spirit of God take away your enmity and make you yield. You are a rebel, a proud rebel, and that is why you do not believe your God. Give up your rebellion, throw down your weapons, yield at discretion, surrender to your king. I believe that never did a soul throw up its hands in self-despair and cry, Lord, I yield, but what faith became easy to it before long. It is because you still have a quarrel with God, and resolve to have your own will and your own way, that therefore you cannot believe. How can ye believe? said Christ, that have honor of one another. 
Proud self creates unbelief. Submit, O man. Yield to your God, and then shall you sweetly believe in your Saviour. May God the Holy Ghost now work secretly, but effectually with you, and bring you at this very moment to believe in the Lord Jesus. Amen. Regeneration and the Holy Spirit Ye must be born again. This word of our Lord Jesus has appeared to flame in the way of many, like the drawn sword of the cherub at the gate of paradise. They have despaired because this charge is beyond their utmost effort. The new birth is from above, and therefore it is not in the creature's power. Now, it is far from my mind to deny, or ever to conceal, a truth in order to create a false comfort. I freely admit that the new birth is supernatural, and that it cannot be wrought by the sinner's own self. It would be a poor help to my reader if I were wicked enough to try to cheer him by persuading him to reject or forget what is unquestionably true. But is it not remarkable that the very chapter in which our Lord makes this sweeping declaration also contains the most explicit statement as to salvation by faith? Read the third chapter of John's Gospel, and do not dwell alone upon its earlier sentences. It is true that the third verse says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But then, the fourteenth and fifteenth verses speak, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The eighteenth verse repeats the same doctrine in the broadest terms. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It is clear to every reader that these two statements must agree, since they came from the same lips, and are recorded on the same inspired page. Why should we make a difficulty where there can be none? If one statement assures us of the necessity to salvation of a something, which only God can give, and if another assures us that the Lord will save us upon our believing in Jesus, then we may safely conclude that the Lord will give to those who believe all that is declared to be necessary to salvation. The Lord does, in fact, produce the new birth in all who believe in Jesus, and their believing is the surest evidence that they are born again. We trust in Jesus for what we cannot do ourselves. If it were in our own power, what need of looking to Him? It is ours to believe. It is the Lord's to create us anew. He will not believe for us, neither are we to do regenerating work for Him. It is enough for us to obey the gracious command. It is for the Lord to work the new birth in us. He who could go so far as to die on the cross for us can and will give us all things that are needful for our eternal safety. But a saving change of heart is the work of the Holy Spirit. This also is most true, and let it be far from us to question it, or to forget it. But the work of the Holy Spirit is secret and mysterious, and it can only be perceived by its results. There are mysteries about our natural birth, into which it would be an unhallowed curiosity to pry. Still more is this the case with the sacred operations of the Spirit of God. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, or whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. This much, however, we do know. The mysterious work of the Holy Spirit cannot be a reason for refusing to believe in Jesus, to whom that same Spirit beareth witness. If a man were bidden to sow a field, he could not excuse his neglect by saying that it would be useless to sow unless God caused the seed to grow. He would not be justified in neglecting tillage because the secret energy of God alone can create a harvest. No one is hindered in the ordinary pursuits of life by the fact that unless the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. It is certain that no man who believes in Jesus will ever find that the Holy Spirit refuses to work in him. In fact, 
His believing is the proof that the Spirit is already at work in his heart. God works in providence, but men do not therefore sit still. They could not move without the divine power giving them life and strength, and yet they proceed upon their way without question, the power being bestowed from day to day by him in whose hand their breath is, and whose are all their ways. So is it in grace. We repent and believe, though we could do neither if the Lord did not enable us. We must forsake sin and trust in Jesus, and then we perceive that the Lord has wrought in us to will and to do of his own good pleasure. It is idle to pretend that there is any real difficulty in the matter. Some truths, which it is hard to explain in words, are simple enough in actual experience. There is no discrepancy between the truth that the sinner believes and that his faith is wrought in him by the Holy Spirit. Only folly can lead men to puzzle themselves about plain matters while their souls are in danger. No man would refuse to enter a lifeboat because he did not know the specific gravity of bodies. Neither would a starving man decline to eat until he understood the whole process of nutrition. If you, my reader, will not believe till you can understand all mysteries, you will never be saved at all. And if you allow self-invented difficulties to keep you from accepting pardon through your Lord and Savior, you will perish in a condemnation which will be richly deserved. Do not commit spiritual suicide through a passion for discussing metaphysical subtleties. End of section 8